Thank you for staying with us. Um, now it's time for Off the Press. We'll be looking at what the national dailies are saying this morning. Joining us to review the papers is Chris Kendi Wandu, member of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators in the UK, Lagos State. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chris. How are you doing? I'm fine. Chartered Arbitrators in UK. Yes, joining Lagos. us yeah, from Lagos, Lagos. Lagos. fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you for joining us this morning. We're just going to review the papers, and we're going to start with the Guardian. Um, the major headline here says: Kanu Sokoto others spend 53.2 billion naira on scholarships abroad. That's a lot of money um, for scholarships. But what do you think about this? Um, the federal government, uh, or rather, some states are spending. 53.2 billion naira on scholarships abroad when we have some universities here. What's your take? Yes, uh, it's a paradox for me uh, because uh, I see no reason why we should be engaging in such uh, uh, activities uh, during this uh, economic meltdown. And uh, we can still, this money can be channeled into the various. Um, universities in those states, Sokoto State, Kano have their own universities. And the first question you ask, how much are they using to fund the, their university? How much are they pumping to those universities to upgrade them to a worst class university? So uh, I don't know the, the rationale behind what they are doing. Uh, that is very prevalent with um, most of our uh, brothers in the north. You don't see much of that happening in the south here. Um, I don't know why they do that every time. You are so many investing in the north. Uh, high, um, grade, um, a grade university, you have university of uh, uh, Medugri, world class. You have about um, uh, ABU. Um, you have other tertiary institutions you know, where most of these people can go to. But um, the governments in those areas always prefer. Uh, doing that every now and then, it's two billion. That is not going to put that into um, the state university or federal universities in most of those states, or even other tertiary institutions, other institutions, not just the universities, other institutions. If you see, if you go to Kano and see the level of amateur um, um, children roaming the streets on a daily basis, it will tell you the level of poverty in most parts of the north. So, if this money is channeled to providing education for those children at the primary and secondary school level, it will go a whole long way. So, I don't know why they engage, they always engage in this. Uh, to me, it's condemnable. I, I don't sincerely. They have to come out to justify the reason why they are spending that so much on scholarship for students to study abroad. For what? Anybody that wants to study abroad should be able to afford it. The parents should be able to afford it. And uh, whoever is trying to sponsor the car should be able to afford it. That's that we should continue to go on this long journey of um, sending people uh, on government funds abroad for scholarship is one thing I don't understand. I don't know where this mentality, the colonial mentality we had right from the 60s, why some people are still, um, still uh, adhering to that. To me, it doesn't make any sense. We come to realize that on a monthly basis, yearly basis, Academic staff in most of these institutions in, 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 in Nigeria University are crying out that they are not being paid salaries, that their wages are not being paid regularly. Most of the lecturers in most of these states, universities, colleges of education and polytechnics are not being paid well. This money can be used to enhance uh, the infrastructure development in these schools and also pay the salaries of the lecturers um, well. I don't know why it should put but as I said, I don't know the rationale behind it. Do you think there is a disconnect between um, the government now and the people? So maybe a warped reality, because there's a writer here that says, despite 4 million out of school children, I mean, they're still doing this. So is it that they don't understand um, the reality of the nation at the moment that children are out of schools and they cannot even afford education but then they put this chunk of money um 53.2 billion into scholarships abroad is there like a disconnect between the government and the people it's obvious i said it earlier on that you go to the north and see the number of our majority um, pupils you'll be shocked and to me i've said it time and time again this is a time bomb 
and uh, waiting to explode. And these children are vulnerable. That is why I high, see a high level of insecurity in the North. Because, and I do find, as they say, it's always the most for sure. These children are not used to us and um, by, uh, by uh, these terrorist uh, bandits, kidnappers, as not only in command, but also um, uh, 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 children used for terrorist activities. I have been in the North. A few years ago, I went to Bauchi State. Um, on the invitation of um, the military. And when I got to some part of Baju State and we stopped somewhere to um, get some things, if you see the way these children swarm on us like bees, some of them have not had their bath for weeks and months, mm. carrying plates in their hands, begging for food. So many running into hundreds and thousands. I am sitting in all parts of the north. Sokoto, Kano, Kaduna, Bono, name this, name them. You see these children on a daily basis roaming the streets, begging for arms. Um, they are called Amajari, Amajaris. And you come to ask yourself, anybody that if with just 2,000 naira giving these children, you can be able to go them to do a lot of things that other children also. But if they are kept in schools, then you will eliminate that if they are educated, believe it. Which is why the government of um, Bobo Jonathan, if you remember vividly, yeah. had this program of, for amateur children. Mm. I don't know whether that system is there. I think that collapsed during the Bwari system. He had a special school built for them so that they can be taken off the street and sent to school. These are the future leaders of tomorrow. If the government in the north, I continue to insist on this because the focus is on the north here. Yeah. If the government of the north continue to deny this and continue to bury their head in the sand, that ostrich that buried his head in the sand and let his whole body go, then this is a time bomb that in the next 10 years, these children will grow up to become serious problem for the government and for the society. So, which is why I'm also warning once again. The government of the north will look at the children of the, these children that are out of school, especially the, if you look at the percentage rate between the south and north, it is just too high. That is on one side. If you also go to the IDP camps, if you say and there are so many IDP camps in the north now because of insecurity, some camps have as much as 100,000 people, some have about 100,000. In Bolivia, for example, the government has been trying its best, doing palliatives and trying to. Um, uh, uh, um, make sure that some of them go back to their home. But I visited Bonu State as well. I visited one or two um, ID camps. And what I saw at those ID camps was nothing to write from my back. It is a very terrible situation. If these so called leaders in this part of the country don't know their obligations to the people and continue to remain disconnected between their people and the then they have, we have a serious problem on our hands that in the future, we are not able to go. We are talking about insecurity now. What we may face tomorrow might just be a child play compared to what we are facing now. Well, I, I, I remember the time of Jonathan that you, you referred to. Uh, I know some people from the north, the same north that he was trying to salvage, uh, were, were against him. And the argument was that it is a tradition. This almagiri and uh, pushing children to the street to beg is a tradition and is part of the religion. And I was wondering at that time how you would just give birth to children and push them to the streets and ask them to, to go and beg. But the worrisome thing is, even the southerners that are trying to go to school, some of the schools that are government-owned, even federal government-owned, are now so expensive. I know people say that education is not for the poor. Education is for someone who is ready. But how much, how much ready can you be in this kind of an economy? We have a headline here, protest in Unical, over 100% hike in fees and levies. When you ask them, they will tell you is the running cost in the institution is because of X, Y, Z, that they have to uh, move these fees high. We had that problem in Lagos as well. Now, in Unical, they are, they are protesting, and we do not know what it will degenerate into. What is happening to our educational system? You have seen the budget and what was uh, budgeted for education. Why will this institution still be? I don't know what your thoughts are. Yeah, there's, there's a unique. Um, most common at this moment is that that fee has been suspended by the investor of Calabar. 
Yes, they've suspended it after that protest by the students. The vice the school authorities came out with a notice last night um, suspending that. And I hope that is suspended for good so that a holistic... It's suspension. It's not removal. Yeah. It's suspension. And it seems... Uh, well, let me not let me not apportion blame to the new VC that came to the school. But for a long time now, we've been seeing almost every every session, every semester, there's increment in one way or the other, and you can't even well, budget. You know, if you that's that, to that, 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 that it happened in like here. Remember, few weeks ago, it happened in like, and it happened in Ife, and it happened in most of the federal universities as well, uh, as well as state universities. Yes. Personally, I we should know that education is, is not it, it, it cannot be totally free because government alone cannot afford education. But that does not shift the responsibility of government to making sure that every Nigerian is educated. So education should be our priority. It should be well subsidized so that even the children of the poor can get to send. Most of our so-called leaders now attended and had free education during their time. Yeah. Some of them wouldn't have been what they are today. If not for the fact that the government was able to subsidize education in those periods and they went to school free, most of their children, their parents were poor and couldn't afford education to send them to school. But because it was highly subsidized, especially in the South, especially in the Western region of Nigeria, during the UPN, during the Ashon Group, and the uh, uh, days, most of these are leaders now. But let me shock you, my brother. We are even talking about federal, state, and private um, investment. Uh, most of the schools that were established by churches, you see most of these churches establishing universities, most of their members cannot afford to send their children to those churches. And you ask yourself, what is the place of religion in our lives? I remember in those days, in the, in the past, we had so many of these missionary, uh, missionary uh, missionaries establishing schools, secondary schools, that is why you get to know of CMS Grammar School, even my own school of Ibobi College, Lagos, which I attended. Um, there was a fusion of Methodists and the CMS. And somebody you saw St. Philbas College, and so many of these uh, uh, missionary schools. The essence then was to be able to get the best out of the students, even those that their parents are not so rich, be able to attend. But they do this by making sure that they set examination for a new entrance and they pick the best of best of you, whether your parents were rich or not. But I ask you again, go and check the school fees of most of these. I don't want to start many the schools and the uh, churches. These are supposed to be missionary, uh, missionary or churches that are supposed to help. If you are not helping the society, you may be able to help it. Oh, they say, oh, we give certain percentage to them, we give certain percentage of scholarship to our members and rest. Is that enough? Is that enough? So, and you now look at, secondly, you also look at the budget. What is our budget, federal budget, state budget for education? There is a threshold, UNICEF has a threshold for budgets for education across the globe. Have we been able to meet ours? So, it, 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 it's so sad me. Even at that, we come to realize that on a daily basis in the public uh, universities, or the federal and state universities, lecturers, are, now there was a news making the rounds a few days ago that the level, the number of universities having their lecturers moving abroad, going abroad, leaving the classrooms, is running into thousands and thousands. Not only in the education sector, in the health sector as well. Three units of um, uh, route have been closed. Three units have been closed because all the doctors and nurses have left and jabbed as it were. And we continue to talk about the issue of funding, the remuneration and rest of it. But what are we seeing? As we have seen in the past few days, probably we'll get to that on one of the papers, where our leaders are moving in, moved in thousands to COP28 in Dubai. And you ask yourself, to do what? A government that promised that they are going to be cutting down on costs, asking Nigerians to tighten their best. While we are tightening their own, they are losing their own and even losing their, 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 their trousers and liquor to be able to accommodate more. And that is the problem. A country where you have seen abject poverty, Nigerians have seen abject poverty, our leaders in the National Assembly will be buying 160 SUV for the way that we spoil it, according to them. They are buying the SUVs because 
we know that we are, we are bad. So for that, we should be able to provide them with their service to be able to move around. It is not in other countries. For people's sake, the greatest everything that legacy any government can do is making sure that the, 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 the citizens are educated. That is why China is doing so well. That is why the United States is doing so well. That is why the United Kingdom is doing well. And so did Canada is doing so well. Every other, even India agrees so well because they are making sure their people are well educated. If you don't educate your people, then you will be 50 years, 100 years left back when issues relating to that comes to the national level. So that is a problem, and I hope that our government is going to do, is do something about it. But it's quite unfortunate that we just pay lip service to education in this country. All right, there's another smaller headline here which says NBS only 1.5% of households affected by 2022 floods received government support. What do you think about that? 1.5%? That is no news now. Is it not? Not in Niger. Is, of course, we know. Money will be released and some people will invest with it. That is how we know. That is, that is the situation. We always uh, we try to take advantage of every situation to be able to enrich ourselves. Ask yourself, what happened to the, 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 the Minister of Monetary uh, Affairs in the last government? As they realized how much was spent by that, uh, by that ministry. And I continue to say, if there's any, any, any past uh, ministry that needs to be proved by this government is the, the Ministry of Monetary Affairs. Where so much money was projected and spent in Africa, and people in Brazil and people that don't want to say nothing happened. A, a ministry that was feeding our children during the COVID period when they were at home with us, and they said they were feeding our children, and nobody could account for that. A ministry that was saying that it was giving us money um, without a well verified register, and dashing, say they are dashing money and take care. So, so if that is what the MBS came out with, then I'm not surprised at all. I'm not surprised. Every period when it comes to the ready season, oh, they say, oh, and people within this certain area should move up land, and uh, because the flood is coming, and the rest of them, most of them become vestures, some of them find themselves in IDP camps, money will be budgeted, and nothing will come out of it. And you continue to ask yourself, what is the place of government? When I mean government, federal and state government. What is the place of Nema in all this? But I am not surprised, as I said, if you did more, it would be more than what we have, what they just reviewed. And that is it. But shouldn't there be like reports of how these monies are being spent? For instance, um, you can't just give money out and you don't know how it's being spent. You don't have the names of the people that have been, you know, um, taking part in this, you don't have anything, you just give out the money and there's nothing coming back to you because I think 1.5% is very low. So if we're saying maybe there's 100%, that means only a few households, you know, got this relief. Who are going to make the investigation? The same people that have compromised already. The only people that can do that normally would be the National Assembly or State House of Assembly because they're supposed to um, oversight activities of the executive. They have no compromise in the state. They are in the pockets of the governors, in the national, in the national assemblies, in the pocket of the president. So, what are they going to do? What kind of investigation are they? They themselves don't they need to investigate it. So that is the problem we have because if we are practicing, as we said, separation of power, executive, judiciary, and legislative, then legislation should be able to do their work because part of their basic function is uh, oversighting activities of executive and some of these things within the program of the executive. But that is one leg to read. Second leg to read is that even after investigation, what happened to um, their reports? Having to see so, so many of them that they also investigated in the past and passed on to the executive and the other. Have you, happened, have you been forgotten the investigation that happened with the NDDCG? Off your mic and not off your mic. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> off your mic and not off your mic scenario. Some of them have even gotten to the point that becoming the president and become a uh, senior mm. members in the National Assembly. If you understand what, what happened to the power sector investigation that was initiated and someone like a uh, was put in charge along the line, we saw what happened. Trillions and trillions of naira were, 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 were budgeted, were put in place and released for that. For example, there have been so many other probes along the line. You need to continue to ask yourself 
which time of the people are we? Let me give you a classical example. There was a guy, there was a guy a, from New York, a member of the House of Representatives Congress, as you say, in the United States. Just three days ago, the Congress voted to remove him from their assembly. Why? That the guy was trying to have, in the course of his uh, election, to have um, embezzled some certain money and then um, made even for money made for his campaign and so that he lied to his, uh, uh, his constituency. He was elected, very, very popular guy in the, in the city of New York. He was now elected into the House of their own House of uh, Representatives, which is the the Congress. Just few, about three days ago, they investigated that guy. Within themselves, the members of the Congress took a decision, voted, and sent him packing hmm. from the from, from 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 the House. Can they do that here? <laughs> okay, well, let's move to another newspaper, uh, a very disheartening one, if you ask me. The headline that we're going to read now: Army drone. That is Daily Trust now. Army drone kills dozens of uh, Molud celebrants in Kaduna State. Um, uh, one paper said it's up to uh, more than 80 of them. The riders are second bomb killed more people during rescue, according to survivors. That means there was, uh, a, there was a second bomb. We buried 94, some mutilated, conveyed 66 to hospital, according to residents. JNI Fitianu, community leaders seek compensation. And then incident unfortunate, military Kaduna government. Uh, that's the headline, very heart-wrenching headline. Army drone kills dozens of Malut celebrants in Kanu. I don't know how you felt when you saw that headline. Yes, you know, when that first news first broke, it was said that it was the Nigerian Air Force jet that yes. bombed um, that village in Kaduna and killed several people. Um, I had to reach out. Don't forget my primary constituency is journalism, with journalists who are an arbitrator as well. My primary responsibility uh, as an individual is journalism. So what I did was to also to reach out to the spokesperson or the spokesman of the Nigerian Air Force on the whole side of the story. And he told me categorically that again, it wasn't the Air Force. I said, who did it? He said, well, more information will come out later and we'll get to you. It wasn't categorical to say that it was by the Nigerian. But for the investigation, uh, I realized that that incident was not by the Air Force. Uh, by that. It was by the Nigerian a drone. It is. It was a drone. You know that. And instead, of the, if you look at the statement that Nigeria Air Force uh, released immediately after that story, they said that we are not the only ones um, operating within this area when it comes to issue. So meaning also that so other security agencies like Nigeria are also involved in the area. And Nigeria, later on, I was meeting the Commissioner of Internal uh, Security in Adunasti. Um, had a meeting with security agencies in the state, and the army owned up that yes, it was a mistake, that there was some kind of level of insurgency within the, that. Uh, probably they thought that those were part of those that uh, were part of the insurgents, and then um, I think that they deployed the drone, which now creates a ramp. And the question I ask is that what is the essence of intelligence? What is the essence of intelligence gathering? Do you just see people assembly and you just assume that they are having some kind of meeting and the rest of them? Therefore, that you just deploy drones. And this is not the first time. Exactly. This is not the first time. I'm sure you it's both of you will It's actually it's the tenth accidental bombing in two years. Exactly. Right. This is not the first time. And you cannot see this happening in other civilized countries. Mm. If you are not sure, you don't deploy. It's just like journalism. If you are not sure of your source, you don't publish. That is what we are taught in journalism. Mm. So even in law that I read, we are told that when you are not to, it will be better for to, um, 99 um, 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 uh, uh, what are, uh, criminals to go scot free than one innocent person to be put in jail. So if you are not so sure of your source, then you don't deploy. So what we deploy bombs to bomb people. When just because of the mere fact that you just have the suspicion that oh they are and that this brings me to the fact that probably also most of these so-called bombs with bombs and social people with killed the social number of some of these people that our military must have been robbing must have been innocent people and that is the fact and that's I hope the last time this is where the office of the national security advisor comes into play 
this incident will be investigated and those behind it must be punished. Just just bomb and these are Nigerians for mercy. Over eight at the point they say it was one hundred and twenty. Just like that, they are just having some kind of movement within the place. And you went there and deploy bombs. And bomb. When do you bomb? Other places you don't bomb. You will be able to control uh, control of the place. Send uh, security agencies, send army, send whatever they were listening, and get these people, if possible, arrested. So, at the end of it all, you bomb them, and that is it. And as I said, this is not the first time. We have been having this consistently. And I hope, I believe, and I'm saying that this must stop. This bombing of civilians must stop. We cannot continue like this, for goodness sake. We are, you, don't, you, you don't solve a problem by creating another problem. Hmm. Hmm. That's quite sad. Okay, um, well, let's see. Uh, Nigeria records 1.8 trillion Naira surplus for foreign trade uh, jumps by 60.7%. Are these the gains that we've been promised that we'll start seeing in this government? Do you have anything, uh, do you see this as a positive beginning to uh, a better future for us in Nigeria? Yeah, it's a positive beginning, if I'm to believe. But most of them are not. Some of us don't believe on this, uh, most of the statistics that read up by the government. It's the government that will tell you that prices of goods and services are going down, and you go to the market, you realize that think of that and you go to the market to realize that a cup of rice has moved from 300 naira to five. My sister there will understand when I talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't call anybody name. I don't call anybody name. I can attest to that. Why wouldn't I know? I might know. And my brother will also understand because uh, they're they're bringing the money. money. Yeah, so we are all in this. So mm -hmm. when they tell you the prices of goods are good, go to the market. It's not just if you go, come out of your street and just go to the nearest apple. Yes. I bet give me one sweet today. You we'll see that the price of sweet yesterday has changed from what it was today, and that is it. So, well, it is yes, good one. I will say it time and time again that uh, that uh, we should be able to diversify our economy. We should be able to export more. That is the only way that we can be able to improve the, uh, the, the, the the current situation we find ourselves. We had in Naira has been to over one one thousand one hundred and fifty up to one hundred um, two hundred Naira to the dollar. We can only improve this by making sure that we find other avenues apart from oil to be able to export more so that we can be able to earn more. That is the only solution. All this one that we are oh, we're going to source for dollars to be able to push in the pet of uh, Nana dollar, no, it doesn't work. So if that is case for oil and go pet, the question we have to ask ourselves is how will that improve the life of Nigeria? How will it really reduce the prices of major bread commodity? The numbers bread that used to be 500 naira has really to reach to 800. Mm. Now, some bread, bread is about 1,100. In my area, it's 1,100. You know, that's long, long loaf that we normally buy for 500. It is now, it is now 1,100 in my area. In some places, it's more than that. Akara. I'm going to Ghana. Akara, I used to buy, I used to buy 50 naira because I love Akara a lot. I'm a typical Nigerian. Yesterday I went to buy a car. They say a car is not seventy naira per just one single one. That is that is and it's about <laughs> rice. Yeah. How much yes. is the bag of rice when Christmas is in now? Ask mm -hmm. yourself. Gary, beans. Yeah, in fact, some people have thought cannot even afford to buy one to buy of yam any longer. And you are talking of families. These are also people that don't have job. Most the father, most of them are not. It, 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 we are having a total reverse in our society. In, in society. We are now, most women are not the ones feeding their families because the men are losing their jobs. Mm. So the women are carrying most of the bodies now. And this is a fact. So you continue to ask yourself, what is the place of government? Now, government said that we're going to be palliative due to the rise uh, increase in crazy How many Nigerians have benefited from those palliatives? All the promises that were made by the federal government. Uh, the only states, the only state in Nigeria, that I will say that have been seen some level of palliative um, distribution is Bono State. Go and see what that government is doing in Bono State. Despite the challenges that that state have, that is a government with a human face. I don't know what the others, the same palliative were doing to member to the, my state, a female state. Nobody in my village has ever. You saw some, some living states in the southwest where some people come to say, 
we are giving a bag of rice to distribute among 3,000 people. How do you distribute one bag of rice among 3,000 people? For goodness sake, who is fooling who? Okay, uh, let's, go, let's just go to the punch. We're almost out of time, but I want to take this. So this says, cash shortage hit banks. Customers rush for BVN, NIN revalidation. I was at the bank on Friday and yesterday, and they said they have no cash. So it is my reality. And even if you have to get some money, there's no money in the ATMs. If you have to get some money, you cannot get more than 10,000 naira. That was the bank I went to yesterday. So this is real. Are we going back to how it was when um, there was cash shortage um, some few months ago? And this is the Christmas period. Should this be happening at this time when we know that people need cash more than ever before? Which is why most of the time I'll be saying that the problem probably wasn't about a mm. The problem is within the system. There is something fundamentally wrong. Uh, yes, we knew that a midlay went overboard in some of the policies it implemented, the new Naira not redesign. Mm -hmm. We are for the first time in the history of Nigeria, we are using Naira to buy Naira. <laughs> Never happened in Nigeria before, it happened under a mid So I can say, but there, is all, there must be some fundamental problem within our monetary policies, and especially the central bank. Initially, we were saying that, oh, it's because that the, 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 the December 31st deadline is still in place uh, for the replacement of old notes. And that is why we are having shortage uh, in, in currency within the system that people are piling up money so that they will not be put on our wares just like it happened last year or at the beginning of the year. But the central bank have come out to say that no, all old notes remains bigger tender. And the central bank has all that means, sorry, the Supreme Court have come out to also give that embargo that was initially placed that by 31st of December. Um, that um, that the old Naira notes, the old green old Naira notes, should not be gotten. They lifted that and back. So that's a bit of so. The question you now ask yourself: Why is this that this money is not available? Where did they keep them? Initially, at the beginning of the year. So what we're having today is because politicians wanted to use it for politics. Are we still in politics? Are we having politics? Are we having an election? The election has gone. We've had our election since March or thereabout. So what are we talking about? So there is a problem within the monetary system where, which I feel that the central bank, the Ministry of Finance, should be able to address adequately. Nigerians are going into um, into the Christmas period, and there will be need for Nigerians to use. And they tell you, oh, everybody should go electronic. Oh, we should, electronic is it the same one that I made transfer? I made some transfers yesterday to today. It has not hit the account of those I sent it to. The one that was transferred to me, it has not hit my account. Mm. Most of the apps of the banks, when you call, you cannot be able to assess. There was a particular bank for almost three days, you could not assess their, their app. You have to go to their bank physically to be able to make a draw. And so, what are we talking about? Yes, the best way to go is electronic banking. But when the systems are not even functioning, then it becomes a problem. I, I can, why should I go to an ATM to be able to try to withdraw? I, and there's something I've noticed. Let me even say this. There's something I've noticed. I think most of these banks and the ATA are, are just uh, doing certain something good. Have you realized that if you go to the bank now and go to the ATA, you may not be able to get, the, get your money? That's why I'm giving that ATA. Now. You see somebody with POS, mm. POS machine, and say, okay, oh, uh, you won't use POS, we are come. You will give the person, you give it, you put it there, and the person will give you cash and collect. So probably there is something also going on within the bank that they could not, probably they think they are not making too much money. Mm -hmm. From this withdrawal, this is our 15 week or whatever, whatever. And if we go to the how come the those doing POS are having the cash, the cash right. and the ones at ATMs at the banks are not having? Right. They should know that something is wrong somewhere. All right. Well, we, we hope everything is resolved mm -hmm. as soon as possible and people can be able to access um, their monies. Thank you so much, Chris, for joining us this morning. Thank you for your insights and valuable contributions. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, too. Thank you, you too. All right, we'll be speaking with Chris Kende Wandu. He's a member of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators in the UK, and he was joining us here from Lagos State. We'll take the weather now and a short break, and when we return, we'll be looking at our first and only hot topic.